Okay, uh, spring break week seven, uh, day two. Um, so today I did, um, I did 30 minutes on the treadmill with a seven on the incline and a three speed for about 30 minutes. And then I got off and I did a chop matrix to kind of hit all my obliques, everything in my pillar. And then I did a overhead squat with a dowel. And then I did an old timey press with a 45 pound dumbbell. Um, all three sets of eight reps. Um, and then kind of continuing off of what I'm doing this week with trying to like summarize everything we've learned um, up until this point. I know the last time we did neuron and action potential. Yeah, neuron and action potential. Um, so then once you kind of have that action potential set, you have two options. You can have an ISPS or an ESPS or an inhibitory postsynaptic transmission or a excitatory postsynaptic transmission. Um, so what that'll do is depending on what happens either way, you'll have that nerve impulse come down to the axon baton. Those uh, calcium channels, the voltage gated calcium channels will open. Um, that'll kind of enter into the synaptic baton. Those synaptic vesicles will then be transported down into the um, membrane of that synapse where they can be released into the synaptic cleft, um, which then they will bind to the ligand gated channels in the postsynaptic neuron where that neurotransmitter can kind of relay that information to the following neuron where that nerve impulse can be either continued or cut off depending on whether it's excitatory or inhibitory. Um, so then we can go into the muscles and muscle fibers. Um, so you have your sarcolemma and you have the sarcoplasmic reticulum inside of there, your mitochondria, you have your thin filaments, your thick filaments, your myofibrils, T-tubules, um, and so on and so forth. So basically the way that's going to work is you'll get that excitatory contraction stimulus, which will go into the um, receptor feet. That receptor feet will then send that signal into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which will release calcium. That calcium will bind to the troponin, which then will flip the troponomyosin to be able to allow those myosin heads to latch on, which then you'll have an ATP and an ATPPI. Um, the ATP will do 50%, and then that inorganic phosphate will do the other 50% of that muscle contraction. Um, and then we go into Hemings, Hemings size principle. So um, anything that's type 1 is going to be high reps, high endurance, um, is less likely to fatigue as fast. Um, those are going to be all of your type 1 muscle fibers as you move up into like type 2a you kind of get a mix of both of those so that's kind of going to be like your 6 to 10 slash 10 to 20 ish rep range um, depending on how well trained you are so that's kind of the mix of those two fibers and then you have your type 2 fibers which is your high force your high strength your 1 to 5 or 6 to 10 um, rep maxes or whatever you kind of are working on that week. They're higher in force production, but they require more um, ATP production and more oxygen to that muscle to get that greater contraction. And then we go into our circulatory phase. So like, how do we get all that to our muscles? So you have your right atrium, which has your superior and inferior vena cava, um, which that's where you get your deoxygenated blood that'll go down the tricuspid valve um, into the right ventricle, up the pulmonary valve, out to the lungs where it gets reoxygenated. It comes back into the left atrium, down the left ventricle, um, out the aortic valve where that can go into systemic circulation where that oxygen rich blood can be transported to the working muscles, utilized, and then excreted back out through the lungs via CO2.